Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm always nervous until I see some people. Okay, I see some eyeballs. Hello. Right before, I so I use this program called Restream, which I guess my annual membership had just expired, which I found out the second before I started uh, streaming this. So I very, very quickly try to reconnect with them. So I hope and that my mic is working. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're here, throw so a lot of you guys watch this on our, on the replay. So I will go ahead and get started and hopefully we'll have um hello. There we go. Great. And my mic is actually working today. I hope. Yeah. Uh, great. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm in Virginia, and we are in some huge, like, St. Patrick's Day rainstorm. It's absolutely just raining buckets outside. So I hope I don't get, if I get disconnected from you guys, just refresh your YouTube, and I'll, I'll go to my cell phone if anything weird happens with my internet or um, electricity. I guess I can do this in the dark, right? Uh, well, welcome everybody. So what we are here to do is talk about the business of professional organizing. So believe it or not, I can hardly believe this myself, but it is my 20th year working in this business. I started my organizing business in 2002. Uh, Springtime. I'd kind of been thinking about it in 2001 and, and kind of getting some ideas out there, but I actually launched in the spring of 2002, which seems like a lifetime ago. I've weathered a recession, a pandemic, <laughs> and all of that craziness, and I'm here. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, it's kind of crazy to think about because I really... I don't, I, it's hard to even think about me being in one business for all those 20 years because my business has changed so much. And certainly one of the reasons I love being an entrepreneur and being your own boss because you can change things up. So I started as a solopreneur um, doing mainly what I call kind of maintenance work or, you know, having some reoccurring clients and and building my business doing a lot of paperwork home office management information management that type of thing and after i got super busy uh, which actually it only took about a year and a half um, i had more clients that i could handle and i decided to bring on employees and contractors and do team organizing so at two years i hired uh, started hiring out my team and doing larger scale organizing projects. Uh, I did that for many years, then got a little burnt out on that, kind of probably right when that 2008 session hit, uh, I was ready to uh, find a little more stability. I downsized my business actually, and went back to sort of a solopreneur and um, only using contractors as needed. And then, oh uh, gosh, maybe 2016, uh, about that time, I decided I really want to focus on my business online. So I got more into blogging, um, which eventually led to me being here on YouTube. And so I uh, went more almost kind of a virtual type business, which is uh, predated COVID. But I was so happy that I had already kind of put into some places some ways to make money virtually with course creation and, and being here on YouTube. So uh, the recession, no, the pandemic was definitely disorienting, but um, because I had already kind of changed my business model up a little bit before that, that actually uh, was great. So I was able to do course creation, online coaching, virtual work. And then in actually during the pandemic as well, I got a call from uh, TV's hoarders. They were filming locally in my area. And I went out to do an episode in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That is on season 12, by the way, now streaming on Hulu. Uh, season 12 of hoarders is available now on Hulu. Uh, the other episodes are on A&E, which you need a, a cable provider to log into. But 
uh, you can get to the um, the Hulu episode season 12. And I thought it was a one and done deal. I thought I'd go out, do one episode, just have some fun. And turned out I've now, uh, I continue to work with the show. I still go out to work on the show and have probably, I've sort of lost count of how many episodes now. I think it's probably in the dozen uh, range. Um, so that's sort of where I am now doing coaching and of course teaching professional organizers. So I'm happy to connect with you guys today. I am happy to answer whatever questions you have about working in this business. If it's marketing, uh, getting your business set up, uh, client process, client challenges, those types of things come up. I do have some emails that were, were sent to me in the last month. Uh, which I'll kind of be going to. And those questions were more about, well, of course, how and when to charge for products when you're organizing. That's a big question that comes up. Um, engaging clients during sessions and then tips for working in extreme clutter. So I'll uh, be talking about those and referencing some email, but I'd love for you guys to come in here and uh, put some questions in the comments. I'll be here for about an hour answering those questions. And I, I love to answer questions on the fly. So you guys feel free to throw whatever you want to at me. Hopefully in 20 years, I've I figured about out about everything there is to work in this business. And I've certainly done it so many different ways. Yes, always, always marketing, always be marketing. Um, yeah, I mean, my biggest marketing advice, which, which, you know, beautiful day, because I think you've gone through my coaching program is to really, you really need to be famous for something. You have to be known for something. So I'll give you an example. When I started, uh, I thought I was going to do one type of organizing. Um, and I, I, I started networking in my community, just getting out and, and knowing, uh, you know, getting to know people in the community and talking about my services. And then it sort of shifted to there was a sort of a different need. And what I found out early on for me was that there was a lot of organizers who did not want to work with information organizing, um, anything to do with uh, computer base. Of course, we didn't have all the apps and, and things at that time, but we had uh, you know, spreadsheets and money managers and things that could organize your digital life and your, um, you know, finances and appointments and that type of thing. And a lot of organizers in my area did not, they didn't want to touch it. They, they weren't comfortable uh, with the technology piece and they did not like organizing paper, paperwork, information, which I loved. So, what happened early on for me to get those first couple of clients is I networked with other professional organizers and they said, these are the jobs I do not want to take. Well, you take them, worked out. Those were jobs that I loved and that launched my business by getting uh, some time in my schedule booked right away. Um, and that was nice because that, you know, gave me that income and some steady work and then I could keep growing uh, from there. I now very much rely on social media to market my business, which of course didn't even exist 20 years ago. So for you guys who are thinking, I don't want to learn, you know, new ways to market my business. Look, take it from me. I mean, Instagram didn't even exist when I started and I, and certainly not YouTube and I'm, I'm here. I figured it out. You know, I took the time to learn it. And so, you know, there is, I think that's exciting actually right? Who's with me on that? I, I think it's kind of cool to learn new stuff. I mean, that's one reason I left my corporate job. You know, it was very stagnant and I just felt like I wasn't able to grow in ways that I've been able to grow as an entrepreneur. So I like that, you know, I like the, that things change and I have to figure out new ways of doing things. For me, that's, that's interesting and exciting. So if you have that passion as well, entrepreneurship may be a good, a good avenue for you. So, um, so yes, you, you, you have to be known for something and people have to be aware of how to refer business to you. So I think one mistake I see with, um, people, uh, or organizers who are getting out there, they're like, okay, I do kitchens and closets and hoarders and papers and students and ADD and, um, downsizing and unpacking. And it's, 
maybe you are great at all of those things, but it's a little overwhelming for someone who's trying to, to refer business to you and find an ideal client for you. Because, you know, if you just go out and say, oh, I can work for everyone, it's just a little too watered down. So always make sure in your marketing efforts, whether it's face-to-face, -face, online, uh, make sure that you're putting out something very specific about you and your business and that if you were in a room with 50 other organizers, they would know how to refer business to you, that that you have something special and unique about your business that other organizers are going to say, yeah, it's the person who you need to call for that. So so think about that when you're marketing business. Um, also, let's see, we have a question. Hi. How do we do this? Um, I want to pull questions up into our, oh good, we got a good group today. Um, there we go, okay, now things are working. So curious about Kunmari, how to start costs, etc. So there is a um, Kunmari certification program and the Kunmari method is a very specific way to declutter your clients homes so there's traditional organizing and there is the kunmari method and you can get certified specifically in the kunmari method um, it involves connecting i think it's just kun it might just be kunmari.com i think is their website google kunmari certification you can find it uh, but this is a certification it starts with applying and you one of the ways you apply is that you um, say, how do I say this? Like you use the KonMari method in your own home. So you KonMari, this is probably not the right way to say it, but basically you KonMari your own home and then you submit photos and an application so that they understand you know how to use the process. So it sort of starts really with reading the books. Uh, there's an online course now, just process, and then submitting an application. Their workshops, I was able to attend probably one of the last in-person workshops. I don't know if they've gone back to doing in-person now. Uh, they were doing virtual workshops. So you attend the workshop. Uh, that's a couple of days. And when I took it, I mean, it's it's pricey. You know, it's a couple of, of, of thousand dollars. And of course, I traveled to New York to take it, but you wouldn't have that expense if you're doing it online. So you start with a paid workshop. Then you have to submit a number of hours showing that you have instructed clients in the KonMari process. So you have to take someone through the process and parts of the process and you submit that and then take an exam and become certified in that process. So uh, if you want more info on that, I believe it's just KonMari, KonMari.com. Or you can Google that, and that's run by uh, their their company. So definitely an option for certification. Uh, the other sort of well, I have that certification, and I also have the one through uh, Napo, the CPO, which uh, involves working a number of hours and then sitting for an exam. So it takes, um, in theory, I would say it's it takes longer to do a CPO because you have to prove that you've worked all of those hours and then you also sit for an exam. And the the annual cost is $100. I've always been in Memo. I think that that's required as well. And that's a couple of hundred dollars to maintain that and you have to do continuing education. Um, but also remember, you guys, you do not have to be certified to work as a professional organizer. You need to work as an organizer and then gain that experience to become certified. So, so keep that in mind. I know there's probably some programs online that say, oh, you can be certified as a something, something. Um, but for, for CPO, Certified Professional Organizer, uh, or KonMari certification, you, you do have to work hours with clients certifications. Awesome. Let's see here. All right, Lauren, I'm in the process of getting my business started and something thinking about doing is helping clients sell their things on eBay or other platforms. Any advice on that? Uh, I, I don't love this idea. I have to tell you, Lauren, um, I, I, 
I'll tell you why, and, and you can kind of draw your own conclusion. And if there's anyone on this um, live who wants to kind of chime in on this, is if they've had any experience doing this, um, how I incorporate sex with my clients is that I make a quick demonstration for them about how to sell in Facebook Marketplace, or I may have... Um, a referral to them for an appraiser or an estate agent. Um, also, I do use eBay in a sense of getting a um, sort of a high level evaluation on items. I'll give you an example. I was working with a gentleman who had inherited a sports memorabilia collection. So we had baseball cards and cereal boxes and, you know, all those types of things. So during our session, I showed him how he could look up sold items on eBay to just get some price points. So, you know, if we had an example of a baseball card he had that had sold on eBay 20 times for a dollar, we could kind of assess that that may not be a high ticket item. And then if we had another item that like consistently went for eBay on eBay for, you know, hundreds of dollars, that was a criteria that we could set that side, that item aside for a um, you know special consideration, whereas the other ones, you know, if it wasn't really valuable, maybe we just donate that or, or pass it along to someone else. And I've done that with books as well. I went through a very very large uh, collection of books in an estate. Most books barely worth a dollar, and uh, we did identify a handful of books that were worth hundreds of dollars. And again, using eBay and online research. Here's where I personally draw the line and you you can decide um, how you want to do this. If, if I actually took that item from a client and brought it to my home and did and listed it on eBay, it's very time consuming. What if the item doesn't sell? What if people are asking questions about it day and night? Am I, am I responding for this question, uh, answering those questions? How would I? bill for that time. So personally, I draw the line at actually taking the item or being involved in the selling process because it's ex extremely time consuming. And honestly, it would probably, they would be paying me more if I was charging my hourly rate to, to sell an item because you have to manage so much communication with the buyer and of course then their shipping and packaging. So I I do think there's a place for professional organizers to be involved in advising our clients on items that are okay to give to goodwill and things that may have a higher price point that they want to take to a consignment store or an online seller. Uh, but personally, I draw the line at, at actually selling the item for them because the um the money just it doesn't it doesn't quite work out time wise so give it a try I've, I've had a few uh people in my coaching program that have come to me and said oh i thought i could sell all these things for someone and then they just ended up in my storage unit and i can't get rid of them and what do i do and how do i charge them so um I haven't heard of this really working out well. If, if someone has another story about it, let me know. But um, in general, that's that's how I uh, I work that. Okay, um, I'm interested in working with seniors with mobility challenges. Should what should I consider when organizing their spaces? Yeah, this is uh, absolutely a type of job that that comes up for professional organizers. And that is, um, I'll tell you kind of a typical scenario is there is a, a client or a potential client and they live in their home. Things are going fine, but they're fairly cluttered. You know, maybe they have things on the floor or crowding staircases or hallways, but nothing, nothing like really terrible, but just just a little little cluttered and, and maybe some extra furniture pieces. And then what happens is that person has, you know, hip surgery or um, some type of long-term, you know, an accident that results in a long-term injury or, or something. Something happens and then um, the organizer, like myself, can get calls, hey, I, you know, 
I'm in a wheelchair now, or dad's going to have to have a walker and the house is too crowded with stuff for him to, or her to move. So this is very common actually that, that comes up in organizing spaces. And it's, it's a reason for people to hire a professional organizer that the, the clutter has now inhibited mobility in someone's home because they've had to transition to a walker or a wheelchair. Um, also, sometimes they want to stay in their home, but they can't go upstairs. And now uh, the house has to be rearranged. So that kind of works in with the same, typically a senior population. So yeah, for me, I'm always looking at, you know, safety, functionality, and, and the mobility. So uh, when I'm doing a job like this, I've got I've got the tape measure out and I'm looking at those pathways. So I'm looking at, you know, is there a clear enough pathway? What furniture needs to be eliminated? What uh, sometimes people just have boxes, you know, stacked up on their floor or, or different things. And so um, I'm usually looking at at the floor. Uh, sometimes you are looking at um height and, and accessibility of, of items like overhead, if their accessibility has changed, uh, that's a big thing. But but probably for me, that first, first pass through, I'm going to clear floors, pathways, um, rocking chairs. <laughs> uh not not so great when people are uh i had a senior client recently I, I recommended please please get rid of this rocking chair because she would sort of grab it uh, you know for stability and, and that's not good so I'm, I'm i'm looking at those pathways initially i would say and then um moving into you know heavier items not being out of reach maybe bring those down a little bit lower in the kitchen and that type of thing uh, there, there's a whole science uh, science to that. So it's, it's quite interesting if you get into, oh, I can't remember, um, uh, maybe uh, the Disabilities um, Act or, or something. There, there may be some guidelines for um, aging in place, maybe something you want to Google and, and look at how to organize homes uh, that way. Um, okay, here's a follow up. Yes, helping people sell things, not sell for herself, but could be a client to set up an area or method to be sold. Absolutely. I mean, estate sales, getting prepared for estate sales. Um, you could educate your client on what consignment stores are available in the area. Uh, it's always good to have an appraiser in that, that you know in your community. And, um, yeah, all those all those good things. We're seniors. Uh, okay, you are not you are not in Ireland, and I'm talking to you on St. Patrick's Day. I guess it's I don't know. It's probably a very different <laughs> different way that we celebrated here in America. Hey, okay, so um, Marianne, I'm working as a PO, but living in a very small town. Any tips on how to spread the word on the business and how to price for the service? Yeah, so pricing is very much going to be dependent on on your market, uh, and you can do some market research. Now, I've talked to many uh, potential organizers in small towns, and they're saying, "Well, there's not even an organizer, you know, kind of in your in this area." So um, you'll you'll have to kind of test the market out a little bit regarding price. But I can tell you, I would say one of the best best ways to spread the word, especially if you're in a small town and people aren't necessarily even aware of what organizers can do. And this is true for anyone even, you know, in the U.S. in a small town. It's going to be your job to actually educate your local community on what professional organizers do. And so one of the best ways to do that is with uh, creating a little workshop, a little lecture, you know, top 10 ways to declutter your house when you're moving, you know, something, uh, five ways to set up a perfectly organized closet, you know, just something where you're sort of educating people in your community about what you do and and just the concept of organization because it's possible they've 
no one in your community has hired an organizer and they don't really know what they would use an organizer for. Uh, so just pick, pick a topic, go out in your community, um, speak to a group of people. And then here's the important thing. This, this is what you guys need to really focus on. When you're speaking to that group, make sure that you allow them to ask questions. And then from those questions that your population is asking, you will better understand what their needs are. And so you're really going to have to listen to people in your community and find out in what ways they could use a professional organizer. Because we all know that so many, there's so many things you can do as an organizer. You can work with hoarders, you can design closets, you can help people uh, move, unpack their house. Uh, you can work with, you know, storage solutions and busy families that are upsizing. You can work with seniors and people that are downsizing. Of course, then we have, you know, Kanmari and, and these other types of organizational methods. So, so yeah, I, I would get out in your community and, and also this, that same concept works online as well. So you can hit, go to social media and start talking about something, you know, how you organize your closet or how you keep your paperwork straight or how you, even time management, you know, you can get into how you manage life with a busy family, you know, anything that you can put out there to connect with people. And eventually you'll find out what the real need is in your community. And then you want to market to, you know, to that concept. Great. What that's, that is a great, a great question. So some of the questions that came in over uh, email. Oh no. Hold on. Does someone have COVID right now? Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for being here, even though you are sick. And I hope you have a, a speedy a speedy recovery. Ah. Oh, gosh. I know. What a crazy time that we live in. So uh, a couple of questions that um, have come in from email this week or this month, I should say. I get this question a lot about how and when to charge for organizing containers. And I think the, 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 this question has a lot of variations. Like, do I buy containers before the first appointment with my client? Do I pay for the containers and then get the client to reimburse me? Do you know, there's there's a lot of variations on this question that I get uh, quite a bit, which, by the way, I did a um, maybe I'll put that in this link to this video. Um, I did a whole video on uh, purchasing like when to purchase containers and how that works into your organizing system. So let me. Let me see if I can find that. Anyway, I'll, I'll look for that and um, post it. And, or you can go to the channel and, um, and look at that. I don't know why my search feature isn't working here. Nope. Come on. There we go containers. All right, there we go. Actually, I'm going to give you guys the blog uh, version of it because that might be a little easier to, um, to process. Okay, so by the way, that's that is my website, myspacematters.com. And um, I have uh, when you go to the blog section, I have a whole section on working as a professional organizer. And so um, you'll you'll find some of that content there. 
So yeah, this is a question I get a lot. So I did do a whole post on it, but um, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is thinking that they have to kind of figure out everything before they go into someone's home. So what I hear uh, new organizers doing sometimes, they say, okay, I'm going to book you know, this time um, in my client's home. I'm not going to charge. I'm going to go in. I'm going to measure. I'm going to try to figure out every container they could possibly use. And then I'm going to put together a budget based on the price of those containers. And then I'm going to present that to my client and say, okay, you know, here you go. What do you think of this? And will you hire me to do it? Um, I do not recommend that you guys go about it that way. Um, one, it's quite likely that the person's not going to hire you um, after you've given them all the information. So you've essentially given away a lot of, of what we do as professional organizers, which is, um, you know, measuring and making space planning and storage solution sort of recommendations. So if you go in and kind of do all of that before you're actually hired by the client, it, um, you may find that you, you're just not really booking enough time to sustain your business. So what I recommend instead is that you, um, you can do a consultation with your client, paid consultation, and then you really don't know what uh, products you're going to need until you actually go through the decluttering process. So if you go into their attic and it's filled, you know, floor to ceiling, and then you say, oh, well, you're going to need 50, 66 quart bins from the container store, and that's going to be $1,200, uh, they may that might not be the case because once you start the decluttering process, you'll find that they don't even need half the stuff that's in their attic. So maybe you only need 20 bins in, instead of 50. So you always want to do the decluttering process first. So I do not bring any products um, with me on that first appointment. I'm not bringing storage containers or, or anything. Uh, I'm coming in, get taking a full, um, sort of snapshot of the house. And I may be thinking, oh, I would probably use this bin in the attic, or you're probably going to need shoe boxes for the closet, or you may need um, photo boxes to store some memorabilia. I, I'm, I may be going there and sort of thinking that, but I'm not buying it or purchasing it, uh, buying it or bringing it or requesting that they buy it at that point. So in that initial consultation, it's just sort of high level ideas of things that may work in this space. And then after the decluttering process, then you can give really specific instructions based on what you know they're going to keep. Um, I like to order online during the session and have it delivered because that's just the easiest to um to deal with instead of me spending time going shop to shop and things are out of stock and going to another target or, or whatever. Um, if you order online and have it delivered to their home, then you know that they'll get exactly what, um, what you have chosen for them. So that would be my preferred method. Um, I've also just given product links to my clients and said, okay, you know, this is what you need. Go ahead and order it on your own. Uh, that way I don't have to invoice for the product later. So, so try that out. You know, don't feel that pressure to have to figure everything out before you even start with that client as a paid client, because uh, you can see how that might, um, can kind of backfire on actually earning money as an, if you sort of go in and, and, and set up everything ahead of also, I've heard from organizers that with them, and then once they declutter the space, it has a lot of you know products that they could use instead, and they don't necessarily anything. So that can happen as well. I like to use what clients already have, you know, use what they have in that space, and um, sometimes I don't need to really buy products at all. Or very little. Let's see here. 
Okay, we've got Nikki. Yeah, so you've considered hosting a home organizing class at my local library. What is your advice and what should definitely be touched on? Thank you. Um, I, I would, I, I have done library workshops. I can tell you, and I don't know where you are, but I can tell you in my area, they have to be free. So I cannot use the library space to do paid workshops. So just, just double check. I don't know if you're doing a paid workshop or just a free workshop to get people involved, but just keep that in mind if it if it's gonna be a paid workshop. Um, but I've absolutely uh, done these. I've done photo organizing. I've talked about paper organizing. I've done senior downsizing. I think what you need to keep in mind is that whatever you talk about is you're going to be attracting that type of client. So if you really want your niche to be in senior downsizing and you want to be known in your community as a go-to person for senior downsizing, then you do not want your workshop to be on high-end closet design. So think about your customer, think about the service that you are marketing, uh, that pe you want people to purchase from you and then design something around that. And if you're just getting started and you're, you're actually just testing out the market and trying to figure out what people like, um, I'll tell you, I did my very first workshop was called uh, top five organizing mistakes. And it was pretty generic and but i used that just to have something to talk about and then when i was talking about that sort of depending on who i was speaking to i learned more about kind of the pain points of that audience so i could present that to a group of female entrepreneurs and find out more oh wow their challenge is really time management you know that's kind of where they land or you could uh, present that to, you know, a group of busy moms and find out that their problem is time management and storage, that they have a growing family and that they haven't quite figured out where to put everything as kids come in and, and all of that. Uh, same thing with empty nesters. They're going to be focused on letting go of things, too much stuff, too much accumulation. Why, are the, why do the kids still have things here when they moved out 10 years ago? So you, you could come up with something really generic if you don't know your audience yet, uh, but it would be better if you kind of know uh, the pain points of your audience and then, and also the type of service you want to offer and, and then have something a little more custom to, to that group. So think about that based on sort of how you're trying to grow your business. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm super invested in working as a professional organizer. I'm still trying to figure out how to get started. One of the things I see myself doing is digital organizing. Any thoughts about that specialty? Yeah, I actually um, did quite a bit of this, the digital organizing. Uh, I think it's a helpful uh, product, service to offer to people. The only thing, the only thing that I would kind of warn you on and something that I don't like about this. I, I like digital organizing almost more as like a coaching and sort of information. Uh, for example, I could go to a client and say, okay, you know, tell me <clears throat> what you're doing for cloud storage. You know, do you have a, a scanner? Do you, um, are you doing e-bills? You know, how can we kind of set you up with, with that so you're not getting as much paper. So there's a lot you can do in, in sort of a consultation. Um, the only thing I've run into that I did not care for is when I got more into actually scanning or um, setting, like installing software, sometimes there would be a technical problem with the client's computer that, that had nothing to do with me, but it would prevent me from doing what what I needed to do. So just kind of keep that in mind. You may run into a few more technical challenges, obviously um, more technical challenges. And um, 
it, it just it can get a, a little dicey, but I would absolutely recommend having that as part of your consultation where you can go in and sort of evaluate, are they ready for digital? You know, where, what are they missing? I'll, I'll give an example. I was working with a client and we were setting her up with some, some different productivity apps and just things to kind of make her life easier. And I had things on her cell phone, but we wanted to put them on her iPad, but her iPad was too old to run certain apps. They, they, they weren't able to load. So I really couldn't do what I needed to do on her iPad because she had to buy a new iPad to get it updated. So that's an example of, of, you know, some things that I'm talking about that you definitely run into more on the digital side. Um, so just keep that in mind. But otherwise, uh, I mean, I've certainly helped many, many, particularly senior clients uh, set up online banking, um, make sure that they are, uh, you know, backing up things to the cloud, that type of thing. So it's it's great um, advice. And, and then when you get kind of in the nitty gritty, sometimes, you know, you you just have to be aware there's a little more more technical stuff that gets into it. I'm just looking at my list here. Yeah, um, one thing I do want to touch on, um, and then I'll I'll hop over to the next question. Thank you guys for keeping these questions going. I love it. Um, tips for extreme clutter. So I've gotten some emails uh, this last month that are like, "Yeah, Catherine, great. I, it, your system makes sense. You know, you're, you're going to sort things, and you're going to walk the clients through a uh, decision making process, and then you're going to put things away and label and buy containers, and it, it's lovely." So I'm often teaching that sort of three step process on YouTube and in my courses and um, in my coaching sessions. However, sometimes uh, I'll get an email that says, wow, my client has so much stuff, I cannot even walk into the room, or I can't get into the garage, or how can we start by categorizing, you know, scarves when I cannot even get to the closet because there's so much clutter on the floor. So I put this in the bucket of extreme clutter. Uh, sometimes it's hoarding. Uh, sometimes it's not. It just, it can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's just sort of extreme shopping or things have just gotten out of control or um, it could be grieving, depression. I mean, there's a whole number of things that, that lead to extreme clutter. Um, but I do want to share with you guys. Um, so I've started putting some videos out on my channel about uh, some some alternative methods that work with extreme clutter. And I just also want to make sure that everyone has my a link to my most recent course, which is called Tackle the Horde. And that is going to give you some alternative um, methods of dealing with extreme clutter. So I think on YouTube, I have one called like Easy to Hard big to small. There's like five of these like approaches that you need that that would work better if if there's just too much stuff that you can't really set up a sorting area to deal with one category at a time. Uh, that of course is the ideal way to do it, but in cases of extreme clutter, we don't always have that option. So if you are, you know, finding yourself more in that situation with um, extreme clutter check out those other videos on YouTube and then um, check out this course on, on um, Tackle the Horde because that will, can I put it up there? Yeah. And so um, all my courses right now are on Teachable. So I've got Tackle the Horde is my new course. Um, something that's really popular is my uh, professional organizer bundle. And that is the absolute best price on getting all of my courses for professional organizers. Uh, the forms you need, the process that you'll follow with your clients. Uh, there's also a workbook in there that's going to help you. Actually, there's a couple of worksheets and workbooks in there to help you set up your business and to also market your business. So let me throw that bundle out to you and 
um, then you guys can also just reach out to me for individual coaching. And that's on my website. Where are you? <clears throat> Here we go. All right. And then that one is the, um, yeah, the course bundle. And that you'll also find that on Teachable. Okay, Charlotte asks, can you talk more about senior downsizing? I'd really like to start working that area, but I have no clue where to start. What kind of classes, qualifications should I uh, get beforehand? Y yeah, I mean, you, you can go pretty deep into senior downsizing. Um, it depends on sort of what phase you want to work at. Um, I think one of the easiest phases for professional organizers to get into is to not really deal with the moving side of things, the packing, unpacking, uh, but just the lead up time to that, which is the downsizing. Um, so that's absolutely, it's, it's not so different than a typical decluttering session. Um, and so how I would describe a, diff, a, a typical decluttering session is just that three-step method where you go into a client's home, you're going to focus on one area, like a closet, kitchen, garage. You're going to start by pulling everything out, sorting like categories, and then you're going to make decisions about those things. And then um, you're you're going to, to put them away. Uh, one thing that's different about senior downsizing is you might not be putting them away. You may just be staging them for the mover to come, you know, and, and moving more things out. But essentially, you know, the sessions don't necessarily look that different than a typical decluttering and organizing session. Um, I think what's different is that typically with senior downsizing, you're tackling the entire home. Um, whereas if you are working in, let's say you're working with, um, a growing family, they may have you just come in and do closets or the kitchen or the garage. And then, you know, you're kind of done until, you know, six months later, the kids have outgrown all their clothes and you need to go in and do it again. So that that's sort of organizing. Um, senior downsizing, you're, you're more likely to go into every single room in the home, you know, every, every closet, the attic, the garage, the basement, and you're you're looking at everything and then um, chunking it down into smaller jobs. But one thing I always ask my senior downsizing clients is, when are you moving? How much space are you going to have when you do move? Um, or are you just wanting to downsize even though you're not moving anytime soon? So sometimes people just want to sort of get prepared in potentially a future in a couple of years, they want to move. And sometimes people will say, I am moving to a one bedroom, 600 square foot apartment in two months. And I'm currently in a 3000 square foot home with, you know, four bedrooms. So it's really important to, to I mean, it's always important to start with the end in mind, but I think with, with downsizing, you really have to understand where they're going and how much they can bring with them. Um, because downsizing could mean going from a three, a 6,000 square foot home to a 2,000 square foot home. To some people that's downsizing, you know, but it also could mean going from a 3,000 square foot home to a 600 square foot apartment. And now you're gonna really need to help someone with the logistics about what they can bring. Um, senior downsizing may be involved connecting them with an estate seller you know, they may want to auction uh, things off in their home. Actually, I've got a couple of great videos on my YouTube channel. One is downsizing fast. And then the other one is just sort of general tips for downsizing. So you definitely want to watch. Uh, I would watch both of those videos to it, it kind of explain how I would, if I only had five days to downsize someone's home, like what I would do each day. And then the other one is just more, you know, if you have a year or a month or more to downsize the steps you would go through. So um, they usually encompass more work and the end result. Uh, one of the big differences with down senior downsizing versus what people like it, let's say you think of professional organizing as like what you see on like the home edit, which is very focused on storage 
and um, containers and, and making sure the home is very functional, which is pretty ideal for someone who is, you know, maybe their kids are, you know, five years to 20 years old. You know, you're really just trying to live in the home, have the best system you can have in that space. Whereas with downsizing, I really don't do any storage solutions in their existing home. Um, you're really more thinking about storage at the next space. So it's it's a little different because you're not really thinking about storage in, in the beginning because you have to sort of eliminate most of what they have and then think about the, the next space. Um, so if you love, 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 you know, storage and containers and designing closets, seeing your downsizing might not be the best um, niche for you. Um, but if you love decluttering and, you know, working more with that elimination process, senior downsizing is fantastic. Um, and I really like senior. It wasn't really a specialty of mine starting out, but I um, eventually did get several senior downsizing jobs and just sort of love the concept of whole home downsizing because it's just a bigger project. You know, you have to really it's not just going in and doing one closet it's like you have to look at the whole home and all the possessions and all the stories and and where um things are going to go oh by the way speaking of down senior downsizing keep the memories lose the stuff that's what i'm reading right now matt paxton from hoarders new book out declutter downsize and move forward uh great stories in here about uh downsizing so might want to pick that up and um, get some tips there as well. Let's see what else guys. By the way, the time always goes by really fast. I feel like we just started and it's almost been an hour. Um, okay. I think, I think I've connected. Da, da, da. Oh, thanks Nikki. Yeah. I, I love, I love coming together with you guys. Um, because, you know, we can we can just brainstorm together. You know, what what are we going to do? How are we going to build your business? Um, I will tell you, working as an entrepreneur and figuring all this out, it's, um, I mean, I really like it. I, I think it's a form of creativity, actually, because, you know, we do need to sort of navigate this whole world. So I really enjoy it. And I hope you guys do as well. Let's see, any last questions? Um, hold on, let me open. You guys put yours in the comments. I am going to hop over here to email and da, 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 da. I have a special folder now with questions. So let me see if there's anything else that's come in. Let's see, we talked about, let's see what this one is. Uh, yeah, I've had some questions about sort of working with other people in your community, like uh, hauling companies, closet designers, estate agents, and that type of thing. And it, that's actually a big topic in, I run a six-week coaching program, which we're, we're kind of right in the middle of um, now with my group. So hello, I know some of you guys are here. And and, and yeah, I, I had this sort of um, kind of epiphany, I guess, that really to do our jobs well, we have to be a resource to our clients and know, okay, here's a hauling company, here's a moving company, here's who can sell your things in an estate sale, you know, here's um, a, a source for you to buy this specific, you know, crafting storage product. Like we really are the resource for our client. And that's, that's a big thing that they're hiring us to do. So if you're just starting out and you're like, hmm, what should I be doing? Who should I be talking to? Uh, one thing that was extremely helpful for me in the beginning was networking, networking, networking within my community. And what helped 
was to think about those resources that my clients would need. You know, we were just talking about senior downsizing. Seniors who are downsizing, I'm sure, will have furniture that they no longer need. So they're going to come to you and say, hey, where can I donate this furniture that I no longer need? And, you know, you're going to want to be uh, up on the which charity shops take furniture, which ones don't, what are the rules? Some things have changed during COVID. Uh, there's certain specifications for upholstered items versus wood furniture and, and all of these things. So, um, but as we're doing that, like as we are collecting those resources for our clients, we are also connecting with people in our community who could potentially be referral sources for us. So if you are going to be offering closet systems to your client, Make sure that you've connected with a closet designer in your community who um, has a company that installs closets and, and different things and, and have that relationship. Yeah. Ba, ba, ba. Oh. Okay, the, the, the products, products for clients, boxes of it. Um, this is... I'm I'm going to say that no, I have not itemized. Um, I one I will say that uh, what I mentioned earlier about for me it's just more efficient to be in my client's home and share the links with them and then have them purchase products you know while I'm there so they could even use their own credit card and that way I don't have to do that extra admin um, thing. Um, I certainly have purchased products and then put that on an invoice. But for me, I've, um, I don't think I've ever itemized them. I give them a copy of the receipt and that has items listed on it. So the receipt is itemized and then on my, and on my invoice, it'll just say, you know, hundred dollars organizing products. So I don't get that, I don't get that tedious about it. Um, not on my invoice. Uh, the receipt would, would cover that piece. Yeah. Good question. Okay, guys, I think I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, have a, a fantastic St. Patrick's Day. Hopefully it's a little drier or warmer for you than, than here in Virginia. Um, season 12 of Hoarders now on Hulu. If you would like to see me, I would recommend the Forest episode and Dolores. You'll Now, you guys have to understand, I'm... I'm I'm working and going and sometimes the camera passes by me and I'm running on the background and that type of thing. Uh, but on those two episodes, you you will uh, see and hear me on a few little segments. And then on season 13, if you guys have A&E, if you have cable access, you can go to the A&E app and watch uh, season 13. Uh, you'll also see me on a number of episodes there, but I would say the best episode to see me on is the Kate episode. I think it's, I think it's a third from the end. And uh, I was, I was fortunate enough to get some, um, some good airtime on that one. And uh, during the cleanup, you'll, you'll, you'll see me running one of the, um, morning meetings. I, I got to host that on air and uh, you'll see me interacting with Dr. Tolan and uh, working with the hoarder. So that is not streaming as of now, but you can find it on A&E. Uh, it's my understanding that these will go to Netflix at some point. Uh, the seasons I've been on, which are 12 and 13 as of that are aired as of now. So Netflix someday, maybe, but uh, as of now, uh, the a &E Network and Hulu. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, email those questions for our next live, and everyone have a productive and safe week.